Hello, doctors, students, and friends of homeopathy. Today, the 1,553rd day of uninterrupted daily webinar of IUFPH is about to begin. And today, our speaker is Dr. Anshu. MD in homeopathy, a PhD scholar. She do have a diploma in nutrition and health. She have a certificate course in hospital management, and she is the professor, Department of Repertory at Homeopathic Medical College, Chandigarh. She do have more than 22 years of clinical experience. And today, the topic is paper presentation in endometriosis and its homeopathic management. Let's welcome Dr. Anshu. I welcome you all for the session. The session will be for 45 minutes, and after that, we will be having an interaction with the speaker. Good evening, everybody. Thank you, sir. Thank you for the invitation. Uh, can I share my screen? Am I audible to you? Yeah, sure. You can share yourself. Yes. Today, my topic is a paper presentation on endometriosis and its homeopathic therapeutics. Is it okay, sir? Yeah, it's okay now. Yes, yes. Uh, so my topic for the today's webinar is a paper presentation on endometriosis and its homeopathic therapeutics. It's a very common problem in the females, which is seen in young females, and they don't know whether they are suffering from endometriosis or not. And it's a silent problem, and it it usually affects the young young, very young females. So if we see the definition, the word itself, endometriosis, is telling you endometrium is growing somewhere else. So uh, ectopic growth, when it is there, usually the endometrium grows in the uterus. But if it is not growing in the uterus, it is growing somewhere else. It's growing in the uterus in, norm in a normal way, but it, if it is growing somewhere else also, then it is ectopic and it is called as endometriosis and the awfully the sites are ovaries i'm sharing it ovaries and uh, peritoneum fallopian tubes these are the various sites which get affected the most important thing for the endometriosis is there are different extra uterine sites it's not only that it is affecting the pelvic cavity it affects the other sites also maybe away from the uh, uh, pelvis the growth of the endometrium occur. The normal growth is occurring inside the uterus. But if the endometrium is growing away from the uterus, in the peritoneum, anywhere else, maybe far away, then it is endometriosis. It's not endometrium is growing inside the uterus. If it is away from the uterus growing, then it is endometriosis. So it's a very aggressive and a progressive and invasive disease. Why I have said aggressive? Reason being is it grows on. With the every menstrual cycle, it grows on and it it spreads. Aggressive in the sense, I'll, I'll explain it. You'll come to know later on how it, it is aggressive and it makes the every part of the pelvic cavity. It affects everything. No doubt, it, it, it is growing with the cycle, with the every cycle. And that is why uh, being a benign, it seems to be a neoplasm, but it's a benign disease. So, uh, there, these are the various sites where it grows. It often grows on the ovaries. And both ovaries are affected in 25% of cases. In 50% of cases, only one ovary is affected. So, pelvic endometrium is affected by 35%. Now, I'll show you the various sites where it grows. Look at the side. The red spots are telling where the endometriosis, endometriosis can be there. So ovary, rectum, even the umbilicus, right? Where the endometrium, where the scar tissue is there, the healing aid tissue is endometrium. Even then, there can occur uh, endometriosis. Uterus, pouch of Douglas, here inside. Colon is also affected. So look at the sites. It is 
how widely it is spread, how widely it is affecting the parts. Now, coming to the prevalence of the disease, if I talk about the prevalence, the real uh, re reasons for the endometriosis is delayed marriage, postponement of first conception, adoption of the small family. Uh, the reason behind the uh, endometriosis is mainly it is hormonal affected and the estrogen is the main cause which causes endometriosis and it excretes every with the every cycle so that means it starts with the menarche and it ends with the menopause so almost full of the reproductive period it gets affected it's not only limited to a particular age group but no doubt the young females are more affected because estrogen effect is more at that time with the menstrual cycle and uh, how the later in the age uh, endometriosis affects late I'll let you know why and how the parity is affected with this, how parity is related with this. So delayed marriage, postponement of first conception, even the taking of contraceptive pills is one reason for the endometriosis, adoption for the small family, delaying the productivity. I've told you because the estrogen is the main hormone which affects the, uh, it's, it's the cause for the endometriosis but and we can't, uh, a female cannot be there, cannot have a menstrual cycle without the role of a estrogen and the progesterone. Then the apron causes is increased use of diagnostic laparoscopy. And the other reason is because of the diagnostic uh, methods, we have come to know that endometriosis is there. Previously, if we talk about 20 years back or 30 years back, the diagnostic methods were not so refined. And people or the females never knew it that they are suffering from endometriosis. So with the diagnostic things, we have come to know that the endometriosis is affecting the females too much. That is why the ratio, if you see, it's very high now. Now coming to the incidence, endometriosis affects roughly 10 to 15 million females of reproductive age. And the main reason is estrogen. It is not found prior to menarche. It's not found after menopause. So whole part is in between the role of estrogen and progesterone. Not progesterone, but estrogen. Estrogen, agar progesterone aajata hai, to endometriosis. If, if, if the progesterone arises or the role of the progesterone comes in, the possibilities of the uh, endometriosis is less. That is why it is more oftenly seen in the young girls because the progesterone hormone is not active. Reproductive system is not yet gone for a reproduction. So the exact cause is unknown. The exact cause is still a mystery. What is the cause behind it? Hormones, both hormones has to act, but we don't know what is the reason behind it. Why the endometriosis again? Why, why a few females are affected? Estrogen and progesterone is already there in every female. With the every menstrual cycle, the uh, hormones are playing role. But why it is affecting the few females? We don't know the reason behind it. So there are various risk factors which is uh, telling about that the endometriosis is there. The risk factors is the family history. If the mother or the sister is affected, the chances of Having endometriosis is more in the um, sibling or in the daughter and the early menarche. So early menarche means the hormonal activity, hormonal stimulation has occurred too early. So menarche starting at the age of 11 increases the risk of uh, endometriosis. Then the short menstrual cycle. If the cycle is a 28 day cycles, we, we usually take 28 plus minus 7 days the normal cycle. If a cycle is of 21 days, again the female is going to the same hormonal stimulation, estrogen is playing the role and uh, more exposure to that of estrogen. If on the other hand, if a female is having a 35 day cycle, so the possibility of a endometriosis is more in a female who has a short menstrual cycle. Then because of, uh, because of endometriosis, there is a heavy menstrual bleeding and it lasts even for the seven days. 
So we have to keep a tab. If a female is having a short cycle and it's for the and the bleeding is for the seven days, we have to keep in mind she might be suffering from endometriosis. And young females, we don't think about that she's suffering. We usually say, okay, this is a normal dysmenorrhea. Doesn't matter. It will go off. No, don't ignore it. Don't ignore it. So endometriosis may also have been associated with certain immune system disorders and hormonal imbalances. Maybe with a sometimes it has been seen that thyroid is also being somewhere related, but it's not been proven yet. Now coming to the various theories which are being postulated, as I've told you, there is no a definite cause, but there are various theories which are responsible for the endometriosis. The most important theory and acceptable theory is retrograde menstruation. Retrograde itself, word is telling you what is the normal procedure of the uh, menses it's opposite to that so going behind the menstrual fluid or the menstrual blood comes from the uterus to vagina to the vulva but if it is going other way around to the uh, fallopian tubes and spilling in the endometri uh, in the pelvic cavity it is retrograde menstruation is there but in few females only the retrograde menstruation is being seen Menstrual cycle occurs in every female. Retrograde menstruation should, would happen in everybody. But no, a few females, a retrograde menstruation is being seen. Transformed peritoneal cells, that is peritoneal cells, are the cells which line inside the abdominal pelvis. So because of that, so certain researchers have been believed believe that these cells may change into the endometrial-like cells which start growing. Then third is, embryonic cell changes are the seen so abnormal changes in the cells which occur which may lead to that of the uh, endometriosis fourth is surgical scar complications this is more often seen in females who uh, where some surgery has been occurred maybe the laparotomy maybe the laparoscopy the scar tissue because the scar is also being made of endometrium there also the endometriosis occur and uh, surgical scar complications arises which may lead to that of endometrium endometriosis of that area endometrial cell transporter transport is also there endometrial cells may get transported to other parts of the body through blood or may by lymphatics so it may be direct also now i'll explain you with the retrograde menstruation so this is retrograde menstruation so the direct implantation theory is there which suggests that the endometrial cells are being implanted. You can see uh, the normal menstruation cycle is coming from the, the fluid is coming, the blood is coming from the uterus to the vulva here and it spills off. Whereas in case of the retrograde, it is going other way around this side. I hope you can see my cursor going around and, and it spills in the pelvic cavity. So this is retrograde uh, menstruation and it is also called as a direct implantation theory which suggests that the endometrial cells are implanted directly via the transcubal regurgitation. Then is this metaplasia theoria. So here also in the silmic metaplasia theoria which suggests that the multipotential cells are stimulated to differentiate into the endometriosis in any tissue of the cilium. So it gets converted. Here the middle there is always a, uh, it has been seen where the endometriosis occur in a female, it may be because of the, some mineral remnants uh, are there. It, it's, it, even if, this is also a hypothesis. It's not been confirmed, it is also a hypothesis that there's some mineral duct remnants or some no, changes are there which leads to this condition. Then is direct implantation theory. So in case of a direct implantation theory, the endometrial and the decidual tissue starts to grow in the susceptible individual when implanted in the new site. So the such sites where the direct implantation theory is being seen are the abdominal scars following hysterectomy, cesarean section. So basically a scar is there which is leading to that. So episiotomy scar, vaginal cervical sites can also be explained with this theory. Then is... Uh, Vascular dissemination theory, it also suggests that the endometrial cells enter the uterine vascular 
or the lymphatic vessels at the menstruation and they are carried to the distant sides. Wherever this changes is occurring, but it is being carried to the other side that is extra abdominal or the other sides which includes lungs, arms and thighs. Here the normal endometrium, the role of endometrium is not there in relation to that of uterus, but it affects the lungs, arms and thighs through the vascular dissemination theory. Then is genetic basis and familial disposition. This I have already discussed with you that a female where the family history is there, mother or the sister is there, the chances of suffering of uh, being suffered from the being affected by the endometriosis are more and it is almost ninefold. Now coming to the pathophysiology of endometriosis, if we say the pathophysiology of the endometriosis under the influence of the hormone, endometrial tissue that is located outside the uterus thickens and breaks down and it bleeds each month because, with, because of the influence of the various hormones that is the estrogen Whatsoever the changes are occurring inside the uterus during the menstrual cycle, same changes occur where the endometriosis is occurring. And because there is no way to uh, bleed out, in case of a menses, the bleeding occurs to the vulva. There is no bleeding where the endometrium is growing. Other sites, ovary or in the pa or in the fallopian tubes or in the peritoneum. They don't have any space. So it spills there each with every cycle. The bleeding occurs and it gets trapped there and it leads to the formation of the cyst. So this cyst leads to scar and adhesions and leading to the infidelity. And other way around also, it also causes the surrounding, irritates the surrounding tissue and causes pain. Now coming to the pathology, if we see the pathology, uh, it, there are small black dot like powder burns seen in the uterosacral ligament and pouch of Douglas. Fibrosis and scarring is there. I have, as I have already told you, the scar tissue is always a cause which leads to endometriosis. So fibrosis, scarring in the peritoneum surrounding the implants. Wherever the bleeding occurs, it gets blocked, it heals on its own and it causes a scar. So implants is also being seen there. There is a red flame like uh, shaped areas are there and the microscopic appearance is both the glands and stroma the, there is a presence of the endometrial tissue both glands and stroma is there and the cyst wall is composed of the fibrosis I'll show you the picture now what what see the picture so there is this all uh, endometriosis classic gun like metal appearances there this this is raspberry spots are there. So bleeding is there, redness is there, flat raised. So this leads to, after this raspberry spots, if this healing occurs, there leads to scarring. Here is the scarring, flat raised white tissue is there and clear berry like small specks are also being seen. And if you don't able, if, if that doesn't heal, uh, in case of the ovary, it leads to a formation of a chocolate cyst. And ovary is in 55% in of chances, the ovary is being affected. So that is why ovarian cyst, chocolate ovarian cysts are often seen. And see why it is called chocolate because it is filled with the old blood. It becomes dark. It becomes uh, chocolate-like color. That is why it is being called as chocolate-filled cyst. Now I'll show the, the pathology. So this is the powder burn appearance. Look at the dots. Powder burn appearance in the endometrium. And this is the chocolate cyst. Oozing of the blood is there, which gets collected. This is the chocolate cyst. Then is uh, this is the normal uterus, fallopian tubes, and ovaries are there. This is ovary. This is fallopian tube. Everything is healthy here, right? And look at the site of endometriosis. How much? Uh, scarring and bleeding is there outside the uterus this you can't you it's difficult to find where the fallopian tube is there and where is the ovary so they're all struck and what it leads to it leads to adhesions they become sticky when it wherever it heals it becomes sticky 
this is these are additions this is addition again this shiny parents is addition this is also addition i'll show you another picture so these are additions so this is addition uh this is also addition there's a little flash also but flash of the light is also there so everything gets sticked it becomes sticky and the sign which tells us because hearing also occurs on, on its own so it lates it it forms a pseudoxanthoma cells occurs which are hemocytin laden stuff stale blood is there basically hemocytin laden macrophages are there so this is the appearance microscopic appearance now what is the patient profile uh, usually a young female is being affected affected i have seen a case of a female of 17 years who suffered badly from the endometriosis so mostly nulli paris and have had only one or two children now what is the reason behind it why being nulli paris young females because only the estrogen role has been there if a female gets pregnant it the uh, progesterone comes and this goes off so longer the nulli parity is there no longer the uh, late marriages are there uh, these all are favorable conditions for the endometriosis so it leads to infertility why infertility because the mobility of the tissue of the fallopian tube inside and the ovary is being not seen it becomes sticky it doesn't lead anything to it mobility is lost so it leads to infertility if the ova is being released it, it it is not being uh, transported to the uterus or the ovary from the ovary it is not being even transported to the fallopian tube the fallopian tube if it being affected becomes sticky it may lead to the formation of hydrosalpings or a biosalpings conditions so infertility is there so another important patient profile is if we the patient is voluntary postponing the first conception i have seen number of cases where the female has undergone um delayed her uh, pregnancy or she has gone mtp first conception mtp and have suffering from endometriosis or infertility in the beginning the female tries not to conceive she is not interested and later on when she wants to conceive she cannot conceive the conditions are not favorable for her and the family history is more important so family history also plays an important role in the profile of the patient the clinical feature this is a triad of endometriosis endometriosis is then complete without this three condition that is dysmenorrhea dyspareunia and infertility the typical sign for the dysmenorrhea is it starts before menses before the onset of menses it starts even one or two days before the appearance of menses so this is a typical sign or typical symptom which tells that the female might be suffering from the dysmenorrhea uh, and with that she may suffer from heavy bleeding i have already told you 7 days menses 6 days menses heavy profuse bleeding is there so these are the conditions which these are the symptoms which guide us that she might be suffering from endometriosis so pain cramp cramping begins before the onset of menses is the most associated one often with the endometriosis and <coughs> sorry it may be very severe moderate and there is no no correlation with the extent of disease yes very important thing which i want to highlight here it doesn't mean that the, if the patient is suffering from a more pain is affected by more of endometriosis no there is no relationship of pain and uh, endometriosis so less of endometriosis may be the patient suffering from a uh, severe acute deep dysmenorrhea and even heavy menses 
it can be other way around also. And more of endometriosis, less of pain is there, intensity of pain is there. Right? So when the erectovaginal septum or the uterosacral lesion is involved, that this leads to constipation and even the pain on defecation is being noticed because everything is sticked. The patient feels pain. There is sometimes even lower backache because of the adhesions. Dyspareunia. Dyspareunia is painful uh, intercourse or painful sex. So it occurs when there is a uterosacral involvement or the vaginal extension is there. So painful, in, painful intercourse is likely due to the fixed retroverted uterus or to the ovarian fixation with the adhesions. So I told you mobility is, not, is lost. That leads to painful intercourse and everything gets stick to the uh, fallopian tube and ovary gets stick behind the uterus. So uterus is also stick on. Normally the uterus where the uh, whatsoever the position of the uterus is there it gets other way around it gets um, stick to it uh, to the various parts of the body and that is why the mobility is lost and uh, uh, conception is difficult so that is why infertility is there then in, there is abnormal uterine bleeding menorrhagia polymenorrhea premenstrual spotting in some cases is also being seen so heavy menses, early menses also, and sometimes even spotting before menses. Even in some cases, I've seen a case where intermenstrual bleeding, metorrhagia is also there. Whenever she had uh, ovulation, she used to bleed for a day. I've seen one case like that. Then there is a chronic pelvic pain, which is backache because of the adhesions. So it's Backache, pelvic discomfort to the lower abdominal pain. Abdominal pain is because of the chocolate cyst which is lying inside the uterus. So chocolate cyst in the ovaries is one of the reasons which may lead to that of abdominal pain. So other symptoms which are there are the symptoms which are related to the organ wise is urinary. Even when the bladder is being affected, it leads to more of frequency, a patient cannot hold urine. Frequency is increased. Painful urination is there. Backache is there. Hematuria is also there. Blood in the urine is also there. If the colon is being affected, sigmoid and colon rectum is affected, then painful defecation, diarrhea, constipation, both diarrhea and constipation. It depends on patient. So diarrhea, constipation is there. Rectal bleeding is there. And sometimes the patient is being mistakenly diagnosed that she might be suffering from an IBS, which is not, which might be, a, and it's other other way, that it, she might be suffering from endometriosis and that is the effect of the endometriosis, which is giving the symptoms of the IBS. She's always lethargic. She may be suffering from low HP because of the heavy menses, anemic, uh, because of the heavy menses, menorrhagia, metorrhagia is there. Then uh, in few females, it has been seen that there may be, whenever she spits, there is some blood there. And obviously, painful surgical scars. So in the beginning also, I've told you that the scar tissue is being made of endometriosis, uh, endometrium. So wherever uh, extra abdominal endometriosis occur, it becomes painful during the menstrual cycle. So whatsoever changes are going in the uterus, around the uterus, during the menses, it also affects the other parts where the scar tissue is there or where the extra abdominal endometriosis is there. Now coming to the abdominal examination of the patient, that is it may not, on abdominal examination, nothing may be felt. But if a chocolate cyst is lying, when the per abdomen it is being palpated, a mass is being seen, but it's very difficult to differentiate whether it is a normal cyst or a chocolate cyst is there. It is so it is being taken that tubo wherein mass is lying because it's not possible whether the mass is lying inside the tube as a hydrosalpings or a pyosalpings or in the ovary as an ovarian cyst or maybe the other uh, other ovarian cyst or chocolate cyst or some other type of cyst is there. So the pelvic examination is a very important. So, biomanual examination, 
will not reveal anything for the any pathology but when some positive findings are being seen that is nodules in the pouch of Douglas is being there fixation of the uterus is there mobility is being lost now coming to the speculum examination so there is in case of a speculum examination bluish spots in the posterior fornix are being seen and when the rectal examination is done, it is just to confirm the speculum examination that there is pain or discomfort is there. Just to confirm the various other examinations. Now, what are the possible mechanisms by which the endometriosis causes the infidelity, infidelity? So, endometriosis leading to infidelity. So, the most important thing is scarring and adhesions. Everything gets stick to each other. Pouch of Douglas sticking to something else. Fallopian tube sticking behind the uterus, ovaries sticking towards the back of uterus, one is in front of uterus. With that, the uh, bowels are being, intestines are being uh, sticked, then urinary bladder is being sticked. Okay. They become, so adhesions are there. Altered tubal morbidity is there also because of the adhesions. Distortion of the tubo ovarian relationship. So maybe coming up as a tubo ovarian mass, abdominal abnormal tubal epithelium is there, chronic salpingitis infection might be there in the fallopian tube, which is leading to again uh, adhesions and the mobility is being lost. Peritoneal fluid changes are there, increased peritoneal fluid prostaglandins, increased number of phagocytosis of the sperms, cell mediated gamete injuries there, ovary dysfunctional luteinized unruptured follicle syndrome because ovary is not able to work properly so it may be least lead to luteinized unruptured follicle syndrome abnormal corpus luteum functional menstrual irregularities are there decreased plasmogen activated activities is there increased rate of spontaneous abortion this is very important because some in females it has been seen that the conception might occur but it leads to abortion Sub-infidelity sub -infidelity is there. Now coming to the diagnosis, how we can diagnose a case. So no characteristic symptoms are expected in the endometriosis, but the severity of symptoms does not correlate with the extent of the severity of disease. So sometimes there is a complex absence of the symptoms in the cases and history of onset of dysmenorrhea, progressive symptoms are then effective to hormone treatment. So most important thing for the dis endometriosis is dysmenorrhea. So dysmenorrhea, very acute, deep acting, starts before appearance of the menses. is the main sign. And the pain doesn't mean the extent of the disease is not being seen with the severity of symptoms in relation to that of pain. Then is biomanual examination. So biomanual examination, there is all found a copstal or stoty feel in the cul-de-sac. Thickened rectovaginal septum, retroverted uterus may be there. Generalized localized pelvic tenderness may be there. And a tender irregular mass consisting of adherent tube ovaries may be there. Now, coming to the uh, ultrasound. Ultrasound or non-invasive procedures cannot diagnose endometriosis. It is not a definite way to diagnose endometriosis. It will just show you the picture of some cyst is lying in the ovary or the fallopian tube has some mass or it tells you about the tube ovarian mass but you can't diagnose that it is endometriosis. It might be salpingitis. It might be hydrosalpings. It might be pyosalpings. It might be some other ovarian cyst but not a chocolate cyst. So endometriosis is not the confirmatory diagnosis for that of uh, uh, ultrasound is not the confirmatory diagnosis for the endometriosis. Now, there are a few things which can guide us about the endometriosis where it has been diagnosed. I'll come to the topic how we can diagnose endometriosis. So, if the CA125 is moderately elevated in the patient, it tells that the patient might be suffering from the endometriosis. Rather, CA125 is the diagnostic aid for the ovarian cancers but if CA125 is being elevated during 
In a patient who has already suffered from the endometriosis, it tells you that the patient might be suffering from the endometriosis again. So moderate elevation of the CA125 in patients with a severe endometriosis is one thing, but it's not specific only for the endometriosis, but it also helps to assess the therapeutic response and follow-up. So I'm telling you once again, it's not for the females in the beginning that CA125 will guide you. It may be mistaken or it may be misleads you that she might be suffering from a ovarian cancer, but which is not. The already diagnosed case of endometriosis, their CA125 is really helpful, which tells you about the reoccurrence of the this disease. But this disease, as this disease can reoccur also. If she doesn't get pregnant, if she doesn't get a good progesterone, maybe some other ways, I'll come there. So she will get affected again. Second is monocyte. Hemotectic protein, that is MCP1 levels, is increased in the peritoneal fluid of the woman with the endometriosis. So this is a very, uh, it's a new one. CA125, since last 20 years I've been hearing, but for last 5-6 years, monocyte chemotactic protein levels is also increased. It's a new diagnostic method to find out whether the patient is suffering from endometriosis or not. So these are the serum markers. Then there is another serum marker which helps to tell us that she might be suffering from endometriosis. Glycodenin, that is placenta protein 14, the level decreases with the removal of the disease. Otherwise, it remains elevated. Then coming to the imaging. So imaging ultrasound will only let you know that the she is suffering from uh, ovarian cyst. But if it is a diagnosed case, already diagnosed case of endometriosis, then we can diagnose endometriosis in an ovary with the help of USG. Sometimes even when the when the USG is being done, there are uh, septa in that, which tells that she has some uh, collection of the fluid. So for the better diagnosis, no doubt CT scan and MRI are better. The best diagnostic tool is MRI. So the sensitivity and specificity is almost 91 to 95%. Now, invasive methods, the best and the gold standard for the diagnosis for the endometriosis is laparoscopy. In the beginning, I told you CA125, USG, they are all, they will all help, but they cannot diagnose endometriosis. Endometriosis can only be diagnosed or confirmed with the help of laparoscopy, which is a double puncture laparoscopy is being done or the laparotomy is done. Sometimes, the patient might be suffering from, she's being operated for some other ovarian system. And, and when when the on the table, it is being seen that she's suffering from endometriosis rather than that of an ovarian cyst. And it is only being seen confirmed by double puncture laparoscopy or a laparotomy. So the confirmation is only with the help of laparoscopy or laparotomy. The complications which arises because of the endometriosis are infidelity, chronic pelvic pain, ovarian cysts because of the endometriosis. So, infidelity because of the adhesions, chronic pelvic pain, pain swing, the mobility is lost of the various organs that leads to pelvic pain and ovarian cyst. One most important thing which I would like to share here is patient who is who is, was suffering from endometriosis is can also again suffer from endometriosis. It doesn't mean that once she has been treated, she has been operated or the treatment has been given or she is free from the endometriosis, cannot suffer. She can suffer again from the endometriosis and infidelity may be there. So it is always being advised whenever the endometriosis is being treated well, no ovarian cyst, no tubo ovarian mass is being seen. She is advised to go for a pregnancy or so that the progesterone arises. In the body, it appears with the pregnancy. The secretion of the progesterone is should, will be there with the pregnancy and it goes off. Even the adhesions goes off because of the presence of the progesterone. Sometimes in allopathy or in the modern science, um, false pregnancy treatment-like conditions are being created that progesterone is being given to the patient so that uh, she gets treated.
Now, there is another classification how we can differentiate what are the various stages uh, of the endometriosis, so which has been given by the American Fertility Society, that is stage one. I'll show you the picture. This is stage one. See the side. This is the minimal amount of the endometriosis. The spots are there. So before surgery, this is stage two, which is mild, where ovaries are being affected. Stage three, this red part tells us. Aldous sac is being affected, left ovary is being affected. Then is uh, this is stage three moderate. So look at the adhesions has appeared. These are the adhesions. Everything got sticked. So adhesions are there. And this is stage four where adhesions are also there. Deep, dense adhesions are there. And this is stage four where it's where everything is sticked. All adhesions. Look at the positioning of the various organs are there. So this is how the stages are there of endometriosis. Stage one, two, three, four, four sphere. Now coming to here, the pictograph is being taken. What uh, American Society of Reproductive Medicine has given a revised classification of endometriosis. Here, uh, when the leposcopy findings are being seen, what what part has been affected? It is being charted down or jotted down here. Now coming to the treatment part of endometriosis, first is most important to avoid patency test. So patency test is very important, which plays a crucial role of uh, leading to that of endometriosis to avoid the patency test immediately after curatage and around the time of menses is very important. Second is forcible pelvic examination should not be done during or shortly after the menses. Third, married women with a family history of endometriosis are encouraged not to delay the first conception. Very important. They are not encouraged to delay the first conception but to complete the family. The curative are to abolish the, or to minimize minimum the symptoms with of the pelvic pain and dyspareunia. Second is to improve the fertility, that is the aim. And the third is to prevent the reoccurrence because it reoccurs. Being benign, it reoccurs. Now coming to the treatment options. Uh, if we talk about the Morton method, the medications, the pain relievers are being given, non-steroid, anti-inflammatory drugs are given. Hormonal treatment is given, oral contraceptives, gonotrophin antagonistics are being given, combined estrogen and progesterone pills are given, danazole, very important treatment, most important, more oftenly, very costly drug, danazole is, is given, IUCDs are being inserted, then in case of uh, surgical options, leposcopy for removing the endometrial tissue, hysterectomy in very severe cases, it is being done. Now, Coming to the fertility treatment, because endometriosis has occurred, it has affected the various parts, mobility is being lost, fallopian tube is gone because of the uh, adhesions, ovary is not able to give the ovum properly, it can't move towards, it cannot uh, move from the ovary towards the fallopian tube to the uh, uterus. So here, in such cases, the IVF is being recommended and some hormonal therapy. Why I have told you uh, hormonal therapy? Because uh, pseudo-pregnancy-like conditions are being uh, created by giving hormones. I told you the main culprit for the endometriosis is estrogen. In majority of the female gynecological problem, endometriosis, not only endometriosis, majority of the gynecological problem, estrogen is the main cause. So, Pseudo-pregnancy conditions being created by giving progesterone. Progesterone is being given and hormonal treatment, OCDs are given to treat dysmenorrhea. If, uh, if endometriosis has affected a lot around the area or that it is second time, it has reoccurred, then the patient may be put on oral contraceptives for a longer time or for a dinosaur, even for the nine months, creating a pseudo-pregnancy, 
like condition the menstrual cycle is being disrupted right lifestyle changes break a sweat that means she should undergo vigorous workout so that's very important then eat more green there there are all these are all uh, lifestyle changes which can help cut the alcohol wrap for the warmth when there is a pain deep breaths relaxation is very important and get a good massage and avoid caffeine these are the lifestyle changes which has been observed which helps in and uh, treating endometriosis now what role does stress plays in the endometriosis the stress can affect the endometriosis in a several ways firstly high levels of stress have a negative impact on the gut so excess of cortisol the major stress hormone pokes the hole in the gut wall which can lead to leaky gut and an increase of inflammation in the body which in turn can accelerate the endometriosis symptom further cortisol is a bulky cortisol impacts all over the hormones and if stress is high the cortisol goes up so in the beginning where i in the in the first slide i showed you break a sweat so when break a sweat is there serotonin is being released which is a happy hormone so stress is being decreased if stress is decreased endometriosis also get decreased so it also helps higher the stress higher the a cortisol higher the chances of getting a endometriosis now coming to the homeopathic treatment now the homeopathy we treat the patient on the totality of the symptoms individualized based treatment is being given so individualization is being done no doubt we have a few drugs which help in treating the endometriosis now this is the repertory part which i have shown, shown you there is a rubric with the endometriosis acute chronic cystic genitalia left and right so we do have a rubric endometriosis in the repertory where various drugs are being mentioned being a psychotic because it is growing causing adhesions causing cystic like conditions thuja is being seen depending upon the site left or right lacuses and apices there no doubt we have other remedies like orum we have cpia we have mer we have pulsatilla then in the kent repertory we have to see under tumors which is ovaries left or right and then cystic so the most important drugs which are being seen used for the treatment of endometriosis is apis thuja arsenic ovista lyco lacuses palladium Adam, Onium, Bromium, Griffite, Cystilago, Tunus, and Hemimalis. Now coming to the Apis. Apis mellifica is the inflammation and induration swelling occurs, especially if the ovarian disease is on the right side with a tendency to drop C. So right side ovarian region extending up to the ribs, stinging type. of pains in the ovaries after sexual intercourse is being seen and the patient has a transparent skin absence of the thirst is there stinging pains are there with, with the ovarian tumors and plus with that of dropsical effusion is there always remember dropsical effusion absence of breast sorry absence of thirst dropsical effusions constipation and right side ovary is being involved when the in in such cases apis is being indicated then is cecal cord so here the inflammation of uterus as well as the ovaries leads to the recurrent ovarian hemorrhages where there is a shedding of the endometrium on the pelvic peritoneum so endometriotic nodules are developed mostly on the uterine ligament and then there is a oozing of the bl black blood when there is no inflammation so metorrhagia occurs this interferes with the real tubal mobility so i told you mobility is being lost during in the endometriosis so it interferes with the tubal mobility and the function that is why it is helpful cecal core is really helpful and leading to recurrent abortions and if not and if it inhibits the ovulation due to the painful intercourse then there is infertility is there then is platina in case of platina irregular uterine bleeding where blood is very black colored with the clots and it is coagulated pressing and bearing down pain in the pelvic region 
which leads to dyspareunia, which ultimately prevents the conception. So constant backache with the bearing down pains, which radiates along the sciatic nerve leads to the numbness of the lower extremities as being there. So high headed bearing down sensations are there, uterine hemorrhages are there. And the character of the blood is black colored with clots. There is Sabina. Due to the disturbed circulation, there is an occurrence of the endometrial tissue in the pelvic endometrium and the ovaries followed by the volunteering. So metoragia usually with the adenomyosis and the intermenstrual bleeding is there. So pain extends from the sacrum to lumbar region to the pubes. That is an indication that is a direction of the specific symptom of the Sabina. So dysmenorrhea where the pain is extending from the sacrum or the lumbar region to the pubes with a constant swear bearing down sensation. Then is lilium tick, extreme relaxation of the pelvic organs. There is development of endometriotic nodules in the uterosacral folds with swear constipation. There is disturbance of even micturation and defecation is there. Then is ferrimet. So ferrimet, tendency towards the engorgement of blood which leads to the occurrence of endometrial tissue outside the uterus, usually at the broad ligament or the pelvic peritoneum. Intermenstrual bleeding where the uterine hemorrhages is copious, thin, liquid, dark and followed by the clotted vaginal bleeding. Metoragia is very important. Metoragia when menses are too soon, too profuse and long lasting. Ecterismosa due to the weakness in the reproductive system. Ecterismosa is there. So, uh, irregular menses, difficult in conception. Tendency towards abortion is there. The more flow, the greater the pain. Dyspareunia with tenderness of the cervical region. Painful intercourse with the tenderness at the cervical region. Here, the ecterismosa is being indicated. Then is xanthophyllum, very important remedy for the severe menstrual pains. The menses are profuse and exhausting. Painful menses with excruciating pain in the pelvis and back, thighs and legs. Sabina, colky, labor-like pains. Pair in the pelvis. Then is, now, as I have told you, triad. Clinical symptoms triad includes Dysmenorrhea, dyspareunia, and inter infertility. So, dyspareunia, under dyspareunia, two remedies are very important sepia and pulsatilla. So, in sepia, mark wearing down, gripping, stitching pains are there in the pelvis. Whereas in pulsatilla, pelvic pain during periods attended with the chills and restlessness, tossing of the bed. Thund, like, there is, uh, no doubt the pulsatilla patient has a desire for open air, but when she has pain during menses, it is a attended with the chills. Then CP and platina are also important. Burning and soreness is present. Genitalia are sensitive to touch. Patient has a low sex drive in case of sepia and platina has increased sex drive. So where the rectal symptoms are there with, because of the endometriosis, naxomica, ammonium mu and lacuses are indicated. So just a second. Yes, now coming to the conclusion, endometriosis is a manageable condition with a timely intervention. This is very important. Whenever we come to know that she is suffering, the female is suffering from the endometriosis, she should be treated immediately. She should be advised to, if she is major, she is being advised to uh, go for a marriage and go for a first conception early, wherever there is a family history. Delayed marriages, leads to endometriosis. This is the risk factor. And that is why if the reproductive period in the beginning, that is uh, because endometriosis effect from menarche to menopause. So 20 to 25 years age is more commonly being seen as with only with a dysmenorrhea. Okay, the patient is suffering from dysmenorrhea. No, it's okay, it doesn't matter. Give, the, give her the medicine, she'll be fine. We don't know what is occurring behind. If she is menstruating for the seven days, she has 
pain even being in unmarried we should consider she might be suffering from endometriosis even the female of 16 years i have 16 to 17 years i have seen suffering from endometriosis so it's very important it should be managed uh thank you importance for importance I... for the early diagnosis is very important sorry to thank just... you sir yeah it's a great i think so i have taken your uh, much of your time no 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 it uh finished in time itself but the thing is we don't have uh, much time to interact with the uh presidents because uh it was a great session from menarche to menopause it is affected and ma'am uh, told lot of things the lifestyle changes we need to adopt exercise uh, eat more green relax stress free life everything is needed and uh, we need to uh, uh, have some more uh, light to be shed on the clinical part also and i think more we will get am soon in the next session sure sir but i think so it it was a informative session but it was a little longer one no no it's very informative and uh, the session went well uh, and we need to uh, uh, know more about the uh, to stop how to stop the painkillers the hormonal therapies and just to go with homeopathic medicines alone and the uh, scope and the statistics uh, 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 on these things uh, in the next session we will sure, sure sir sure that because it's now to wind up and it's time to start the next malayalam session yes sir and thank you thank you so much i'm uh, uh, thank you very much sir on behalf of iup iuph i am thanking you dr anshu for this session and i thank you all for attending this session thank you sir Bye.